Before we get to the movie, Tony, I understand you've brought a relic from your past. In my younger, more ambitious uh, print job days, I actually went and made a zine. It is issue number one. There were no issues after that. But it is my 25 favorite movies at the time. Wow. The back is a little checklist where you can check off all the ones you've seen. And there are little hollow stars underneath each little write-up so you can pencil in your own review. What That's you... really cool. Why don't you, real quick, give me the top five. In no particular order, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. That's a good one. Terrible title. It's a wonderful title. I hate, I hate that It title. lodges in the brain and it does not let go. The Third Man. Yeah. Phantom of the Paradise. Oh, yeah. Escape from Alcatraz. Never seen it. Oh, you are missing out. Is that George Roy Hill? No, uh, Don Siegel. Don Siegel, yeah. Deep Red. Never even heard of Deep Red. That is Dario Argento. That is some great 70s Italian horror. Known in the country as Profondo Rosso. I don't love the third man as much as the rest of the world does. And it's very frustrating to me. <laughs> I've watched it several times, and every time I watch it, I think, it's good. It doesn't fire for you, and that happens. Yeah. And that's just accounting to taste, which shouldn't be held against anybody, barring exceptions. You can actually tour the sewers of Vienna, and if I get to Europe, I will go there. And someone will follow you playing a zither. It would make me so happy. <laughs> Shambling around. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. Welcome to The Basement, Tony Mayer, for the second half of Sci-Fi July. Matt Sloan, thank you for having me. We've known each other for a long time, and I know some things about you. And one of the main things I know is that you are a very big Doctor Who fan. This is true. Unfortunately, Doctor Who is a television show, so we can't really watch it on this show. Wait a minute. There was a Doctor Who movie, wasn't there? There were two of them. There were two of them. If they were theatrically released, I think we could watch them on this show. I think we could watch... Doctor Who and the Daleks. Yes! My God! <laughs> Released in 1965, DWATD stars Peter Cushing as the titular Doctor, as well as Roberta Tovey, Jenny Linden, and Roy Castle. It was directed by Gordon Fleming. It was followed in 1966 by Doctor Who Invasion Earth 2150 AD. The lava lamp was invented in 1963 in England, and it is featured in certain scenes of this movie, making this possibly the first movie ever to feature a lava lamp. Oh, wow. I hope it's during a steamy sex scene. <laughs> if you're expecting one of those, prepare to be extremely disappointed. Okay. This is a real interesting movie because it is an adaptation of the very second story uh that was featured on the show in 1963. Right now I'm going to consult Variety's Complete Science Fiction Reviews and see if they have anything to say about this movie. All right. Sci-fi adventure based on popular BBC tele-serial. Exploitation opportunities seem boundless and lively for juve patrons. <laughs> Doctor Who is out there exploring space, going to fantastic worlds. So your gift, Tony, is from space. Oh, yeah. Magic space crystals. That's right. I can grow my own hypnotic crystal from Metabolus 3. Perhaps those crystals could be a, a power source for the spinning TARDIS. Do not eat. All right. Well, run down the corner to that innocuous-looking police box and get inside and get ready for an adventure as Tony and I take to the old leather couch for Doctor Who and the Daleks. If you could just, with special effects, put in the TARDIS sound and make this disappear from my hand, I'll hold really still and then I'll drop it. In a quiet English drawing room, the family is catching up on their science book reading. There's little Susan, that's Barbara, and that's Doctor Who, a human mortal Earthman. Not what I expected. He's just a normal, doddering old English gentleman. Well, I don't like this one bit. <laughs> Barbara's new boyfriend is coming over. His name is Ian. Ian's a bit of a clumsy drip. He bumbles into things and crushes candy with his butt. <laughs> Doctor Who wants to show everyone his new invention, the TARDIS. It stands for time and relative dimension in space. It is a police box on the outside. My goodness, look at all this pornography. <laughs> it's a big 
room full of scientific wonders. My gob has been smacked. You are privileged, young man, to be the first visitor to our time and space machine. I was so impressed by your entrance to my house that I wanted to tell you my secrets. Ian bumbles around and accidentally launches them out into wherever. I hadn't even set the controls. We could be anywhere in the universe and at any time. We could be in Pittsburgh. They open the door and find themselves to be on this green alien world. It seems like the forest was burned down. All the trees are petrified. Something horrible has happened here. <laughs> And in the distance... Look! A city! I think we should get out of this place. That's fine. He activates the lever. What's the matter? You flooded the engine, stupid! And he tells them that there's a problem with the mercury fluid links. Some of that precious mercury has dripped out. They need some more, so hopefully they can find some on this world. Outside of the TARDIS, the doctor finds a box with some vials of liquid in it. Hmm, this will be interesting to study later. They go to the city. Grandfather, are you all right? Just a little tired. My legs are rather weak. That's better. Yes. <laughs> they find these things that look like elevators, and they decide to split up. Mm, BBC's one through 500. <laughs> Doctor Who cops to Ian. There is nothing wrong with the fluid link. I just didn't want to leave until we had explored the city. You bitch. Suddenly, the Daleks make themselves known. Time to exterminate! You will move ahead of us and follow directions. Search him. Fondle him. Touch him everywhere. That is of no value to you. Well, very convincing. And they imprison the gang. Everyone's been noticing ever since they've been on this planet, they've been feeling really weak and sick. We found a Geiger counter upstairs. This planet has a high level of radiation. We've been Chernobling ourselves this whole damn time. <laughs> Our prisoners are showing signs of radiation sickness. No oh, shit. So everybody's dying. The doctor is willing to bet that that liquid that's in the TARDIS is some sort of anti-radiation serum that will stop them from dying. The Daleks find this out. They want that serum too. Then they can leave their robotic bodies and go out on the planet, which they currently can't do. So they send little Susan to go back to the TARDIS to get the stuff. If she returns with the drug, am I to allow the prisoners to use some? No. He's a cold-hearted Dalek. Look into his plunger. She races through the forest. She makes it to the thing. She grabs the thing. Someone comes in through the door. Boogity boogity. It's this man. Aladon. He is one of the Thals. Hello. I'm fabulous. <laughs> he is. He gives her an extra supply of the drug so that she can give it to her family. She goes back. Have you brought anything else from your ship? The Daleks find the drugs that she has hidden on her, but amazingly, they allow her to give them to the Doctor and Barbara and the rest of them. The Thals want to meet with the Daleks, and they want to exchange this anti-radiation medicine for food. Let us offer them food. Let us have a barbecue. It will be lots of fun. But they're going to double-cross the Thals. A trap, yes. They want to exterminate them. Yes. Exterminate the Thals. These guys are demonstrating some big Dalek energy right now. Oh, there are them lava lamps. Yeah, nice. Do you think Plunger Hand is jealous of Gripper Hand? I would be. Food will be left for us in that great hall. We are to collect it tomorrow. They decide they need to get out of this cell so they can warn the Thals. You see, the floors are all metal. Dalek's power is fed to them through static electricity. If we could insulate those machines from their power source, they would be helpless. It's gonna be easy, isn't it? Excuse me, Mr. Dalek. Would you care to move on to this game? I hate Ian. So they figure out they can use the plastic cape to cut off the power source, use a little crummy Dalek food to blind him. Ooh. She got a dookie in her hand. So when the Dalek comes in to give them their food... Dalek! Yeah! Ah! 
they push it on top of this cape and it dies out. They scoop out the little alien goblin, toss him out like yesterday's garbage. Ian climbs inside. He's going to pretend to be a Dalek. They manage through various ruses and trickeries to get themselves out of prison. Orders are not to capture them. They are to be destroyed. Come on. You got to say the E word. The palms are coming for their food supplies. They're walking into a trap. They send out Temesis. Cautiously treading forward in his Chelsea boots. <laughs> it's a trap! Go back! Run! Temesis is exterminated. Run! Run in a medium pace! Outside, the doctor encourages them to fight against the Daleks. We're a peaceful people. Yeah, well, you're going to be a peaceful, hungry people then. They tell the doctor and his family to just go home. Goodbye. 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 The fake problem with the mercury fluid link has now turned into a real problem because the Daleks took it. So they can't go anywhere. We'd like to help you. Mm, but we don't feel like it. We do not wish to kill others. And I do not want any of my people to be killed. I only wish to kill a burger. God, I'm hungry. So he decides to test that commitment. Perhaps if we gave them all of your people instead, they might return the piece of equipment they took from me. Take her to the Daleks. And they find out that the Thals can indeed fight when they are stirred to do so. Oh. Why, I'm the happiest I've been all day. The Daleks synthesize the drug, they test it out on some of their members, and it doesn't work. Well, then what we're going to do is... Explode another neutron bomb and increase radiation throughout the planet to a point where even the drug of the Thals will not be able to protect them. Oh, that's cold. That's some Putin shit right there. They decide... They decide to attack the Dalek city in two waves. Ian and Barbara, they're going to sneak through the swamp with a couple of other Thals and find like a back entry into the city and kind of infiltrate it that way. The swamp is alive with mutations. I saw four turtles eating pizza and doing kung fu. <laughs> they make their way through the deadly swamp. Barbara always stands out in her salmon pants and light blue top. A fine, fun outfit for a bit of exploring on alien worlds. All right, rest. I'm knackered. Gulp, gulp, this radioactive water is delicious. They find these pipes. The pipes have got to go to the city, so they follow the pipes through the mountain. Destroy the Thals! You're not saying the right word. Come on. Destroy the Thals! Exterminate! Even I know that! <laughs> I don't even watch this show! <laughs> One of the Thals says he can't go on. He's having cowardly feelings. And the other one uses his newfound power of fighting to punch him in the face. And their fist fighting causes a rock slide. Now there can be no question of going back. <laughs> Grandfather, I told you to watch the cakes. Oh yes, yeah, the cakes. The cakes! For goodness sakes, just look at those cakes. Oh, get it on the good foot. Back in the woods, the doctor sees someone playing with a mirror, and he says, gather all the mirrors you can. We'll go to the gates of the city, we'll confuse our sensors with the mirror reflections, and that's how we'll get in. It doesn't work. The doctor and Susan are recaptured. They learn of the plans to detonate the bomb. Begin the countdown! No! 199! Barbara and Ian and friends finally get into the city. Well, there were no Daleks at the walls. We came into the city easily. They get to the main control room where the countdown is happening. There's a big fight. Stop the countdown! The bomb will destroy the planet! Ian, you're our only hope! Daleks! They destroy their control panel. The nitwit saves the day. That's my lucky number. But he's still a dork. The central computer was also controlling the power that was being fed to the Daleks. So without all that power, they go inert. All right. Now remember, kids, vent the steam in the Instant Pot before you open the lid. <laughs> the Thals are safe. We do not have much with which to thank you. So we will thank you with nothing. Good day. Doctor Who has his part back. His machine is fully operational. The coordinates are set. Ian flips the lever, but something's gone wrong. They're not in London. <laughs> Oh. 
This is the result of the meeting between Doctor Who and the Daleks. Okay, there's a lot to dig into here. I'm <laughs> glad I have an aficionado of the franchise with me. I'm glad to finally be helpful after all these years. <laughs> so, first of all, I want to get some insight as to the general fan reaction to this movie. Uh, it's not a part of the canon for obvious reasons. That it is not. Do fans, are they dismissive of this uh, film and its sequel? Are they pissed off about it or, or what? For a while it was considered an oddity. The view of it in fandom has broadened. And I think people appreciate how much different of an experience it is from the black and white small screen to the big screens of the cinema and the production values that Amicus Studios threw at it. As far as 60s sci-fi goes, it's pretty good. It's a very overly simplistic plot. It's a very much a condensation of the plot of the TV show, because the TV show was half-hour serialized episodes, and that was about eight episodes, four hours worth of story that got condensed and bits chopped off. It hits all the beats of that story. The versions of the Doctor that I'm familiar with is that the Doctor is always an enigma. We don't really know a lot about his past, except what comes out gradually throughout the show. Mm -hmm. We don't know a lot about his personality, you know, when he regenerates, and we, we have to kind of learn about him. And in the show, that works. I don't think it works here. We really don't know anything about this Doctor, and I think it's to the detriment of the story and the character. I'm not sure why they didn't make Cushing just make him an alien. I think it was the complicated rights issues of the time. Oh, rights? Oh, okay. Because right. you have the Daleks, who were created by writer Terry Nation. He had the royalties to those, and it's his name that you see in the credits of this movie. So he owned those characters? He owns the Daleks. Okay. Uh, they have to negotiate every time they use the Daleks on the show. But when it comes to the Doctor, you have characters named Doctor Who and Susan and Barbara and Ian, but maybe not the rights to use those story elements. It's a tawdry mess. And it still goes on to this day. Like, even on streaming, there are families who own the rights to specific stories who are in negotiations with the BBC, and as a result, those episodes are pulled from streaming, so you cannot watch them. Well, I'm sure that these copyright issues that you mentioned prevented them from using the theme song, which is one of the most recognizable things about the show. Exactly. And one of the most exciting things about the show. But also, the Daleks said exterminate once. Yeah. It was not a thing for them yet. It, well, oh, it wasn't a thing for them yet. It, oh. it popped up, and then in repetition, it would come back. Like, this movie came out in 66, so we only had about three sure. Dalek stories. It's really interesting watching the Daleks in this, because you really get a sense of their personality. They're not very good at lateral thinking. When things go wrong, they just can't deal with it. What is happening? I cannot see them! I cannot see them! Help! Oh, Dalek! Yes! <laughs> <laughs> so that's interesting that they're these brutal killing machines, but they're kind of stupid. They're singularly focused. Yeah, and if anything deviates from their plan, that throws them into a tizzy. I wish the Thals had something about them that made them interesting. Some ability that humans don't have. Just something to set them apart. And Ian. He's such a change from the TV show. TV Ian, as played by the recently deceased William Russell, was upstanding, brave, kind of funny, a real supremely cool dude. And it seems like movie Ian... They wanted him to have sort of a capability arc, where he's just such a dweeb, but then throughout the course of the movie, he shows himself to be able to rise to the occasion and help. And then gets the gift of a cape and takes the time to mince. <laughs> we all need to take the time to mince every once in a while, Tony. Just for you your know, health. You gotta work that into your, your self-care routine. A little mincing. One sachet a day. <laughs> The leader of the Daleks, Aladon. Leader play. of the Thals. The Thals. The leader of the Thals, Aladon. I shouldn't be the one who corrects you on that. See, you're slipping Same into thing. the... It's a slippery slope when you start getting into this franchise. Aladon is played by an actor named Barry Ingram. He is also the voice of Basil of Baker Street, the great mouse detective. Episode 4 of Welcome to the Basement. It is not a great movie, but it feels to me like a Saturday afternoon. Doctor Who has returned home, the Daleks have been defeated, and now it is time for us to take a trip to a little something called Seen It. I have seen it! Stephen T. Heathen. Godzilla Minus One was not only the best film I've seen this year, but the best film I've seen in the last ten years. Seen it. 
seen it. It finally got to streaming. I checked it out. Sorry that you did not get the chance to see it on the big screen because writ large, it is five times more effective. I went and saw it when it uh, did a limited run through AMC on their big IMAX screen and yeah. the sound was three notches too high. It legitimately made me feel small. It's a story about a giant monster, but it's also a story about a man kind of letting go of shame. Being able to live his life again after having these experiences with war and PTSD and feeling like a failure, feeling like a traitor. Of all the Godzilla movies I've seen, it did the best job at balancing the human story with the monster story. Which is a very tough thing to do and very isolating when a Godzilla movie gets that ratio wrong. New Fran House says, Seen it? Escape from New York. The coolest opening to a movie with special visual effects by James Cameron. You seen it, Pliskin? Call me Snake. <laughs> I think my favorite person entering that movie is Ernest Borgnine sitting in the theater just grinning like a maniac watch the show. In the middle of the New York hellscape, they still were able to put on a show. Yeah. Everyone's coming to New York, New York. <laughs> One of the actors who uh, was on stage doing that floor show. Yeah. I saw this in the credits. His name is... Low Moan Spectacular. <laughs> it's got a, such a sense of humor. Whenever I watch Escape from New York, which I, I've seen it many times, but the question that always comes to my mind is, how do they eat? And what do they eat? My guess is that there's some food shipments that get airdropped into it. And I'm thinking the Duke of New York lays hands on them immediately, keeps the best stuff, and distributes the rest. Yeah. It'd be how to keep a population loyal. Mm. And Donald Pleasance is just like his tweaky best. Uh, you're the Duke of New York, eh, number one? When he's terrified, you believe it. I can see the trauma on his face and in his body. Speaking of Escape from New York, Spooky Uki writes, Escape from L.A., so terrible. Seen it. Seen it. I saw it on your recommendation. It's exactly the same movie. Oh, yeah. Beat for beat. Map of the Stars Eddie is basically a composite of Cabby and Brain. I'm not sure where Pam Greer's transgender smuggler fits in. The, one of the worst missteps he's ever done, the digital alteration of her voice. Just turns it into such a cheap mean joke. I think that character could have stood up and been badass if it had just been Pam Greer. And also the movie is really libertarian. It's almost a libertarian manifesto. Yeah. There's the line where she says, it sucks in here, but at least you can wear a fur coat if you want to. <laughs> and then she's immediately killed by a random bullet. Which begs the question, is it, is it serious or satire? Right. Is all of this unrestricted freedom really the great thing that it's cracked up to be? In the end, true freedom is anarchy. Because he yeah. shuts down all the technology on the planet. Yes, he does. Andy Bearchan writes, I was 18, living in Utah, and I saw Eating Raul. My first truly cult film, it was unlike anything my sheltered Midwestern brain had seen. Seen it. Seen it. I didn't know it was directed by the man who also stars in it, Paul, Paul Bartel. If John Waters and Robert Crumb had a baby, it would be little Paul Bartel. He is such a freak, but he's one of those quiet freaks. Yeah. Who could sit down in polite society. Oh, sure, yeah. It's kind of a dirty L.A. movie in the, in the same vein as Repo Man. The skeezy parts of society sort of laid bare. I didn't connect with this in this same way that I connected with say Repo Man, because I felt like I knew those characters. I don't feel like I know Paul and Mary Bland. I don't think they're knowable. Robert Beltran is nice and sleazy as Raul, which is a shock to me, because I only knew him as Commander Chakotay on Star Trek Voyager. Oh, really? Yes, he's Captain Janeway's right-hand man. Well, it may look small from the outside, but it's a lot bigger on the inside, and that's our website, welcometothebasementshow.com. You can see our entire catalog of episodes. You can watch them. You can just watch one right after the other. And there are PayPal donation buttons that you can click on to make a one-time or rolling monthly monetary donation to support this show. We certainly appreciate it. We've got some new monthly donors, Eric and Amber is fossilized tree sap. What an unkind thing to say about Amber. That I just read what's on the screen and I put it on the page and I read it. That's, that's, that's what they count on. And I also want to thank John who recently raised his monthly donation. He started at one level and he raised it to another one. What a stand up dude. What a stand up dude. Stand up and keep rolling. There you go. Tony will return next week for the unboxing show. We don't have a lot to unbox this week, folks, but we'll find some way to pass the time. And right now, you can pass the time by looking at this.
She is totally going to break up with him when they get back to Earth. Totally. She is done. You can tell she is done with him. Catch! Whoa! It's stopped me, Nathan!